All right, all right. Here it go again. Now you tell me. Okay. This is A New Earth by Eckhart Tolle. Tolle. Awakening Your Life's Purpose. Chapter 2. Ego. The Current State of Humanity. Words. No matter whether they are vocalized and made into sounds or remain unspoken as thoughts, can cast an almost hypnotic spell upon you. You easily lose yourself in them, become hypnotized into implicity, believing that when you have attached a word to something, you know what it is. The fact is, you don't know what it is. You have only covered up the mystery with the label. Everything, a bird, a tree, even a simple stone, and certainly a human being is ultimately unknowable. This is because it has unfathomable depth. All we can perceive, experience, think about is the surface layer of reality, less than the tip of an iceberg. I'm going to say that again. This is because it has unfathomable, unfathomable depth. All we can perceive, experience, think about is the surface layer of reality, less than the tip of an iceberg. Underneath the surface appearance, everything is not only connected with everything else, but also with the source of all life out which it came. Even a stone, and more easily a flower or a bird, could show you the way back to God to the source, to yourself. When you look at it or hold it and let it be without imposing a word or a mental label on it, a sense of awe, of wonder arises within you. Its essence silently communicates itself to you and reflects your own essence back to you. This is what great artists sense and succeed in conveying in their art. Van Gogh didn't say, that's just an old chair. He looked and looked and looked. He sensed the beingness of the chair. Then he sat in front of the canvas and took up the brush. The chair itself would have sold for the equivalent of a few dollars. The painting of that same chair today would fetch an access of 25 million. Excess? Of 25 million. When you don't cover up the word, the world, with words and labels, a sense of miraculous returns to your life that was lost a long time ago when humanity, instead of using thought, became possessed by thought. A depth returns to your life. Things regain their newness, their freshness. And the greatest miracle is the experiencing of your essential self as a prior to as prior to any words, thoughts, mental labels, images. For this to happen, you need to disentangle your sense of I, of beingness, from all the things it has become mixed up with, that is to say, identified with. That disentanglement is what this book is about. The quicker you are in attaching verbal or mental labels to things, people, or situations, the more shallow and lifeless your reality becomes and the more deadened you become to reality, the miracle of life that continuously unfolds within and around you. In this way, cleverness may be gained, but wisdom is lost, and so are joy, love, creativity, and aliveness. They are concealed in the still gap between the perception in their interpretation. Of course we have to use words and thoughts. They have their own beauty, but do we need to become imprisoned in them? Words reduce reality to something human mind can grasp, which isn't very much. Language consists of five basic sounds produced by the vocal cords. They are the vowels A, E, I, O, U. The other sounds are consonants produced by air pressure, S, F, G, and so forth. Do you believe some combination of, some, of such basic sounds could ever explain who you are? 
or the ultimate purpose of the universe, or even what a tree or stone is in its depth? The illusory self. The word I embodies the greatest error and the deepest truth, depending on how it is used. In conventional usage, it is not only one of the most frequently used words in the language, together with the related words me, my, mine, and myself, but also one of the most misleading. In normal everyday usage, I embodies the primordial, primordial error, a misperception of who you are, an illusory self of identity. This is the ego. This illusory self, sense of self, is what Albert Einstein, who had deep insights not only into the reality of space and time, but also into human nature, referred to as an optical illusion of consciousness. That illusory self then becomes the basis for all further interpretations, or rather, mis or misinterpretations of reality, all thought processes, interactions, and relationships. Your reality becomes a reflection of the original illusion. The good news is, if you can recognize illusion as illusion, it dissolves. The recognition of illusion is also its ending. Its survival depends on your mistaking it for reality. In the seeing of who you are not, the reality of who you are emerges by itself. This is what happens as you slowly and carefully read this in the next chapter, which, you're about, which are about the mechanics of the false self we call the ego. So what is the nature of this illusory, illusory self? What you usually refer to when you say I is not who you are. By a monstrous act of reductionism, the infinite depth of who you are is confused with the sound produced by the vocal cords or the thought of I in your mind and whatever the I has identified with. So what do the usual I and the related me my or mine refer to when a child learn when a child when a young child learns that a sequence of sounds produced by the parents vocal cords is his or her name the child begins to equate a word which in the mind becomes a thought with he who he or she is at that stage some children refer to themselves in third person johnny is hungry soon after they learn the magic word i and equate it with their name, which they have already equated with who they are. Then other thoughts come and merge with the original I thought. The next step are thoughts of me and mine to designate things that are somehow part of I. This is identification with objects, which means investing things, but ultimately thoughts that represent things with a sense of self, thereby deriving an identity from them. When my toy breaks or is taken away, intense suffering rises, not because of any intrinsic value that the toy has. The child will soon lose interest in it, and it will be replaced by other toys or objects. But because of the thought of mine, the toy became part of the child's developing sense of self, of I. And so as the child grows up, the original I thought attracts other thoughts to itself, it becomes identified with the gender, possessions, the sense perceived body, a nationality, race, religion, profession. Other things the I identifies with are roles, mother, father, husband, wife, and so on, accumulated knowledge or opinions, likes and dislikes, and also things that happened to me in the past, the memory of which are thoughts that further define my sense of self as me and my story. These are only some of the things people derive their sense of identity from. There are ultimately no more than thoughts held together precariously by the fact that they are all invested with the sense of self. This mental construct is what you normally refer to when you say I. To be more precise, most of the time is not you who speaks when you say or think I but some aspect of that mental construct, 
the egoic self. Once you awaken, you still use the word I, but it will come from a much deeper place within yourself. Most people are completely identified with the incessant stream of mind, of compulsive thinking, most of it repetitive and pointless. There is no I apart from their thought process and the emotions that go with them. This is the meaning of being spiritually unconscious. When told that there is a voice in their head that never stops speaking, they say, what voice? Or angrily deny it, which of course is the voice, is the thinker, is the unobserved, unobserved mind. It could almost be looked upon as an entity that has taken possession of them. Some may call this demons. Some people never forget the first time they disidentified from their thoughts and thus briefly experienced the shift in identity from being the com content of their mind to being the awareness in the background. For others, it happens in such a subtle way that they hardly notice it, or they just notice an influx of joy or inner peace without knowing the reason. Lime water break. The voice in the head. That first glimpse of awareness came to me when I was first, well, I was a first year student at the University of London. I would take the tube subway twice a week to go to the university library, usually, usually around nine o'clock in the morning, toward the end of rush hour. One time, a woman in her early 30s sat opposite me. I had seen her a few times on that train. One could not help but notice her. Although the train was full, the seats on either side of her were unoccupied. The reason being, no doubt, that she appeared to be quite insane. She looked extremely tense and talked to, talked to herself incessantly in a loud and angry voice. She was so absorbed in her thoughts that she was totally unaware, it seemed, of other people or her surroundings. Her head was facing downward and slightly to the left as if she were addressing someone sitting in the empty seat next to her. Although I don't remember the precise content, her monologue went something like this. And then she said to me, so I said to her, you are a liar. How dare you accuse me of? When you are the one who's always taken advantage of me, I trusted you and you betrayed my trust. There was an angry tone in her voice of someone who had been wronged, who needs to defend her position lest she becomes she become annihilated. As the train approached Tottenham Court Road Station, she stood up and walked toward the doors with still no break in the stream of words coming out of her mouth. That was my stop too, so I got off behind her. At street level, she began to walk toward Bedford Square, still engaged in her imaginary dialogue, still angrily accusing and asserting her position. My curiosity aroused. I decided to follow her as long as she wa was walking in the same general direction I had to go in. Although engrossed in her imaginary dialogue, she seemed to know where she was going. Soon we were within sight of the imposing structure of Senate House, a 1930s high rise, the University Central Administrative Building and Library. I was shocked. Was it possible that we were going to the same place? Yes, that's where she was heading. Was she a teacher, a student, an office worker, a librarian? Maybe she was some psychologist research project. I never knew the answer. I walked 20 steps behind her and by the time I entered the building, which ironically was the location of the headquarters of the Mind Police in the film version of George Orwell's novel in 1984, she had already been swallowed up by one of the elevators. I was somewhat taken aback by what I had just witnessed. A mature first year student at 25, I saw myself as an intellectual in the making. And I was convinced that all the answers to the dilemmas of human existence could be found through the intellect, that is to say, by thinking. I didn't realize yet that thinking without awareness is the main dilemma of human existence. I looked upon the professors as sages who had all the answers and upon the university as the temple of knowledge. How could an insane person like her be part of this? 
I was still thinking about her when I was in the men's room prior to entering the library. As I was washing my hands, I thought, I hope I don't end up like her. The man next to me looked briefly in my direction, and I suddenly was shocked when I realized that I hadn't just thought those words, but mumbled them aloud. Oh my God, I'm already like her, I thought. Wasn't my mind as incessantly active as hers? There were only minor differences between us. The, the pre predominant underlying emotion behind her thinking seemed to be anger. In my case, it was mostly anxiety. She thought out loud. I thought mostly in my head. If she was mad, then everyone was mad, including myself. There were differences in degree only. For a moment, I was able to stand back from my own mind and see it from a deeper perspective, as it were. There was a brief shift from thinking to awareness. I was still in the men's room, but alone now, looking at my face in the mirror. At that moment of detachment from my mind, I laughed out loud. It may have sounded insane, but it was the laughter of sanity, the laughter of the big-bellied Buddha. Life isn't as serious as my mind makes it out to be. That's what the laughter seemed to be saying. But it was only a glimpse, very quickly to be forgotten. I would spend the next three years in anxiety and depression, completely identified in with my mind. I had to get close to suicide before awareness returned, and then it was much more than a glimpse. I became free of compulsive thinking and of the false mind made. I, I can attest to this. The above incident not only gave me a first glimpse of awareness, it also planted the first doubt as the absolute valid, validity of the human intellect. A few months later, something tragic happened that made my doubt grow. On a Monday morning, we arrived for a lecture to be given by a professor whose mind I admired greatly, only to be told that sadly, he committed suicide sometime during the week by shooting himself. I was stunned. He was a highly respected teacher and seemed to have all the answers. However, I could as yet to see no alternative to the cultivation of thought. I didn't realize yet that think is, thinking is only a tiny aspect of the consciousness that we are nor did I know anything about the ego, let alone being able to detect it, to detect it within myself. Content, content and structure, the ego. The egoic mind is completely conditioned by the past. It's conditioning in twofold. It's, cons well, wait. it's conditioning is twofold. It consists of content and structure. In the case of a child who cries in deep suffering because his toy has been taken away, the toy represents content. It is interchangeable with any other content, any other toy or object. The content you identify with is conditioned by your environment, your upbringing and surrounding culture. Whether the child is rich or poor, whether the toy is a piece of wood or shaped like an animal or a sophisticated electronic gadget makes no difference as far as the suffering caused by its loss is concerned. The reason why such acute suffering occurs and concealed in the word my, and it is structural. The unconscious compulsion to enhance one's identity through association with an object is built into the very structure of the egoic mind. One of the most ba basic mind structures through which the ego comes into existence is identification. The word identification is derived from the Latin word idem, meaning same, idem, and facere, or facere, I don't know, fac facere, I don't know, which means to make. <laughs> So when I identify with something, I make it the same. The same as what? As what? The same as I. I endow it with the sense of self, and it so becomes part of my identity. One of the most basic levels of identification is with things. My toy, my toy later becomes my car, my house, my clothes, and so on. 
I try to find myself in things but never quite make it and end up losing myself in them. That is the fate of the ego. Identification with things. The people in the advertising industry know very well that in order to sell things that people don't really need, they must convince them that those things will add something to how they see themselves or seen by others. In other words, add something to their sense of self. They do this, for example, by telling you that you will stand out from the crowd by using this product and so by implication, by more fully yourself, be more fully yourself. Or they may create an association in your mind between the product and a famous person or a youthful, attractive, happy looking person. Even pictures of old or deceased celebrities in their prime work well for that person, in their prime work well for that purpose. The unspoken assumption is that by buying this product, though some magical act of appropriation, you become like them, or rather, the surface image of them. And so in many cases, you're not buying a product, but an identity enhancer. Desiber designer labels are primarily collective identities that you buy into. They are expensive and therefore exclusive. If everybody could buy them, they would lose their psychological value and all, would, and all you would be left with would be their material value, which likely amounts to a fraction of what you paid. What kind of things you identify with will vary from person to person according to age, gender, income, social class, fashion, the surrounding culture, and so on. What you identify with is all to do with con content. Whereas, the unconscious compulsion to identify is structural. It is one of the most basic ways in which the egoic mind operates. That's where that, oh, when I got comfortable, everything went to shit. Content. Being comfortable. <clears throat> it's bad. <laughs> Paradoxically, what keeps the so-called consumer society going is the fact that trying to find yourself through things doesn't work. The ego satisfaction is short-lived, and so you keep looking for more, you keep buying, keeps consuming. Of course, in this physical dimension that our surface selves inhabit, things are a necessary, inescapable part of our lives. We need housing, clothes, furniture, tools, transportation, they may also be things in our lives, there may be also things in our lives that we value because of their beauty or inherent quality. We need to honor the world of things, not despise it. Each thing has beingness, is a temporary, each thing has beingness, is a temporary form that has its origin within the formless one, life, the source of all things, all bodies, all forms. In most ancient cultures, people believed that everything, even so-called inanimate objects, had an indwelling spirit. And in this respect, they were closer to the truth than we are today. Where, when you live in a world deadened by mental abstraction, you don't sense the aliveness of the universe anymore. Most people don't inhabit a living reality, but a conceptualized one. But we cannot really honor things if we use them as a means to self-enhancement. That is to say, if we try to find ourselves through them. This is exactly what the ego does. Ego identification with things creates attachment to things, obsession with things, which in turn creates our consumer society and ec economic structures where the only measure of progress is always more. The unchecked striving for, for, for more, the endless growth, is a dysfunction and a disease. It is the same dysfunction in cancerous cell, the cancerous cell manifest, whose only goal is to multiply itself, unaware that it is bringing about its own destruction by destroying the organism of which it is a part. Some economists are so attached to the notion of growth that they can't let go of that word. So they refer to recession as a time of negative growth. 
A large part of many people's lives are consumed by an obsessive preoccupation, preoccupation with things. This is why only one of wait, this is why one of the ills of our times is object prolification. Prol 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 proliferation. When you can no longer fill the life that you are, you are likely to try to fill up your life with things. As a spiritual practice, I suggest that you investigate your relationship with the world of things through self-observation, and in particular, things that are designed with the word mine. You need to be alert and honest to find out, for example, whether yourself, whether your sense of self-worth is bound up up with things you possess, whether your sense of self-worth is bound up with things you possess. Do certain things induce a subtle feeling of importance or superiority? Does the lack of them make you feel inferior to others who have more than you? Do you casually mention things you own or show them off to increase your sense of worth? in someone else's eyes and through them in your own? Do you feel resentful or angry and somehow diminished in your self, sense of self when someone else has more than you or when you lose a prized possession? Maybe. The Lost Ring. When I was seeing people as a counselor or spirit and spiritual teacher, I would visit a woman twice a week whose body was riddled with cancer. She was a school teacher in her mid forties and had been given no more than a few months to live by her doctors. Sometimes a few words were spoken during those visits, but mostly we would sit together in silence. And as we did, she had her first glimpse of the stillness within herself that she never knew existence existed during her busy life as a school teacher. One day, however, I arrived to find her in a state of great distress and anger. What happened, I asked. Her diamond ring, of great monetary as well as sentimental value, had disappeared, and she said she was sure it had been stolen by the woman who came to look after her for a few hours every day. She said she didn't understand how anybody could be so callous and heartless as to do this to her. She asked me whether she should confront the woman or whether it would be better to call the police immediately. I said I couldn't tell her what to do, but ask her to find out how important a ring or anything else was at this point in her life. You don't understand, she said. This was my grandmother's ring. I used to wear it every day until I got ill and my hands became too swollen. It's more than just a ring to me. How can I not be upset? The quickness of her response and the anger and defensiveness in her voice were indications that she had not yet become present enough to look within and to disentangle her reaction from the event and observe them both. Her anger and defensiveness were signs that the ego was still peeking through her. I said, I'm going to ask you a few questions, but instead of answering them now, see if you can find the answers within you. I will pause briefly after each question. When an answer comes, it may not necessarily come in the form of words. She said she was ready to listen. I asked, do you realize that you will have to let go of the ring at some point, perhaps quite soon? How much more time do you need before you will be ready to let go of it? Will you become less when you let go of it? Has who you are become diminished by the loss? There were a few minutes of silence after the last question. When she started speaking again, there was a smile on her face and she seemed at peace. That the last question made me realize something important. First, I went to my mind for an answer and my mind said, yes, of course, you have been dis diminished. Then I asked myself the question again, has who I am become diminished? 
This time I tried to feel rather, I, ra I tried to feel rather than think the answer. And suddenly I could feel my I am -ness. I never felt that before. If I can feel that I am so strongly, then who I am hasn't been diminished at all. I can still feel it now, something peaceful, but very alive. That is the joy of being, I said. You can only feel it when you get out of your head. Being must be felt. It can't be thought. The ego doesn't know about it because thought is what it consists of. The ring was really in your head as a thought that you confused with the sense of I am. You thought that I am or a part of it was in the ring. Whatever the ego seeks and gets attached to are substitutes for the being that it cannot feel. You can value and care for things, but whenever you get attached to them, you will know it's the ego. And you are never really attached to a thing, but to a thought that has I, me, or mine in it. Whenever you completely accept a loss, you go beyond ego and who you are, the I am, which is consciousness itself, emerges. She said, now I understand something Jesus said that never made much sense to me before. If someone takes your shirt, let them have your coat as well. That's right, I said. It doesn't mean you should never lock your door. All it means is that sometimes letting things go is an act of far greater power than defending or hanging on. In the last few weeks of her life, as her body became weaker, she became more and more radiant, as if light were shining through her. She gave many of her processions away, some to the woman she thought had stolen the ring, in which each thing she gave away, her joy deepened. When her mother called me to let me know she had passed away, she also mentioned that after her death, they found her ring in the medicine cabinet in the bathroom. <laughs> Did the woman return the ring, or had it been there all the time? Nobody will ever know. One thing we do know, life will give you whatever experience is most helpful for the evolution of your consciousness, COVID-19. How do you know this is the experience you need? Because this is the experience you are having at this moment. Feel. Is it wrong then to be proud of one's possessions or to feel resentful toward people who have more than you? Not at all. That sense of pride, of needing to stand out, the apparent enhancement of oneself through more than and diminishment through less than is neither right nor wrong. It is the ego. The ego isn't wrong. It's just unconscious. When you observe the ego in yourself, you are beginning to go beyond it. Don't take the ego too seriously. When you detect egoic behavior in yourself, smile. At times you may even laugh. How could humanity have taken, have been taken in by this for so long? How could humanity have been taken in by this for so long, ego. Above all, know that the ego isn't personal. It isn't who you are. If you consider the ego, if you consider the ego to be your personal problem, that's just more ego. The illusion of ownership.
to own something. What does it really mean? Does it mean to make something mine? If you stand on a street in New York, point to a huge skyscraper and say, that building is mine, I own it. You are either very wealthy or you are delusional or a liar. In any case, you are telling a story in which the thought form I and the thought form building merge into one. That's how the mental concept of ownership works. If everybody agrees with your story, there will be assigned pieces of paper to certify their agreement with it. You are wealthy. If nobody agrees with the story, they will send you to a psychiatrist. You are delusional or a compulsive liar. It is important to recognize here that the story and the thought forms that make up the story, whether people agree to it or not, have absolutely nothing to do with who you are. Even if people agree with it, it is ultimately a fiction. Many people don't realize until they are on their deathbed and everything external falls away that no thing ever had anything to do with who they are. In the proximity of death, the whole concept of ownership stands revealed as ultimately meaningless. In the last moments of their life, they then also realize that they were looking throughout their lives for a more complete sense of self that they were really looking for their being had actually always been there. I had actually always already been there, but had been largely obscured by their identification with things, which ultimately means identification with their mind. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Amen. Jesus said, for theirs will be the kingdom of heaven. What does poor in spirit mean? No inner baggage, no identifications, not with things, nor with any mental concepts that have a sense of self in them. And what is the kingdom of heaven? The simple but profound joy of being that there is that is there when you let go of identifications and so become poor in spirit. This is why renouncing all possessions has been an ancient spiritual practice in both the East and West. Renunciation of possessions, however, will not automatically free you of the ego. It will attempt to ensure its survival by finding something else to identify with. For example, a mental image of yourself as someone who has transcended all interest into material possessions and is therefore superior is more spiritual than others. There are people who have renounced all possessions but have a bigger ego than some millionaires. Lord, I don't want that, hello. If you take away one kind of identification, the ego will quickly find another. It ultimately doesn't mock Okay, it ultimately doesn't mind what it identifies with as long as it has an identity. Anti-consumerism or anti-private ownership would be another thought form, another mental position that can replace identification with possessions. Through it, you could make yourself right and others wrong. As we shall see later, making yourself right and others wrong is one of the principal egoic mind patterns, one of the main forms of unconsciousness. In other words, the content of the ego may change. The mind structure that keeps it alive does not. One of the unconscious assumptions is that by identifying, identifying with an object through the fiction of ownership, the apparent sol solidity and permanency of that object, of that material object will endure your sense of self with greater solidity and permanency. This applies particularly to buildings and even more so to land since it is only, since it is the only thing you think you can own that cannot be destroyed. The absurdity of owning something becomes even more apparent in the case of land. In the days of the white settlement, the natives of North America found ownership of land in an incomprehensible concept. And so they lost it when the Europeans made them sign pieces of paper that were equally 
incomprehensible to them. They felt they belonged to the land, and the land did not belong to them. The ego tends to equate having with being. I have, therefore I am. And the more I have, the more I am. The ego lives through comparison. How you are seen by others turns into how you see yourself. If everyone lived in a mansion, love you, Johnny. If everyone lived in a mansion or everyone was wealthy, your mansion or your wealth could no longer serve to enhance your self, sense of self. You can then move to a simple cabin, give up your wealth, and regain an identity by seeing yourself and being seen as more spiritual than others. How you are seen by others becomes the mirror that tells you what you are like and who you are. The ego's sense of self-worth is in most cases bound up with the worth you have in the eyes of others. You need others to give you a sense of self. And if you live in a culture to, that to a large extent equates self-worth with, with how much and what you have, if you cannot look through this collective delusion, you will be condemned to chasing after things for the rest of your life in the vain hope of finding your worth and completion of your sense of self there. How do you let go of attachment of things? Don't even try. It's impossible. Attachment to things drops away by itself when you are no longer seek when you no longer seek to find yourself in them. In the meantime, just be aware that your attachment to things. In the meantime, just be aware of your attachment to things. Sometimes you may not know that you're attached to something, which is to say identified until you lose it or there is a threat of loss. If you then become like a breakup, that's where mine came. If you then, because I'm, I wasn't really attached to certain things, I never was really like, I want this, I want that, but here and there, but the breakup, that was my loss and that was, yeah, anyway. If you then become upset, anxious and so on, it means you are attached. If you are aware that you are identified with a thing or a person, the identification is no longer total. I added that. I am the awareness that is aware that there is attachment. That's the beginning of transformation of consciousness. Waiting, or wait, of wanting the need for more. The ego identifies with having, but its satisfaction in having is relatively shallow and short-lived one. Concealed within, it remains a deep-seated sense of dissatisfaction, of incompleteness, of not enough. I don't have enough yet. By which the ego really means I am not enough yet. As we have seen, having the concept, the concept of ownership is a fiction created by the ego to give itself sol solidity and permanency in making itself stand out, make itself special. Since you cannot find yourself through having, however, there is another more powerful drive underneath it that pertains to the structure of the ego, the need for more, which we could also call wanting. No ego can last for long without the need for more. Therefore, wanting to keep the ego alive much more than having. The ego wants to want more than it wants to have. And so the shallow satisfaction of having is always replaced by more wanting. This is a psychological need for more. That is to say, more things to identify with. It is an addictive need, not an authentic one. In some cases, the psychological need for more or the feeling of not enough that is so characteristic of the ego becomes transferred to the physical level and so turns into insatiable hunger. Insatiable, insatiable, oh, I think that's right. 
The sufferers of bulimia will often make themselves vomit so they can continue eating. Their mind is hungry, not their body. This eating disorder would become healed if the sufferers, instead of being identified with their mind, could get in touch with their body and so feel the true needs of the body rather than the pseudo needs of the egoic mind. Some egos know that some egos know what they want and pursue their aim with grim and ruthless determination. Genghis Khan, St Stalin, Stalin, Hitler. To give just a few larger than life examples, the energy behind their wanting, however, creates an opposing energy of equal intensity that in the end leads to their downfall. In the meantime, they make themselves and many, many others unhappy or, in the larger-than-life examples, creates hell on earth. Most egos have conflicting wants. They want different things at different times, or maybe not even know what they want, except that they don't want what is, the present moment. Unease, restlessness, boredom, anxiety, dissatisfaction are the result of unfilled, unfulfilled wanting. Wanting is structural, so no amount of Con content or content can provide lasting fulfillment as long as the mental structure remains in place. Intense wanting that has no specific object can often be found in the still developing ego of teenagers, some of who are in a permanent state of negativity and dissatisfaction. The physical needs for food, water, shelter, clothing, and basic comforts could easily easily met for all humans on the planet, were it not for the imbalance of resources created by the insane and rapacious need for more. The greed of the ego. It finds collective expressions in the e economic structures of this world, such as the huge corporations which are egoic entities that compete with, the, with each other for more. Their only blind aim is profit. They pursue that aim with the absolute ruthlessness. Nature, animals, people, even their own employees are normal, no more than digits on a balance sheet. Lifeless objects to be used then discarded. The thought forms of me and mine are more than of I want, I need, I must have, and of not enough pertain not to content or content, but to the structure of the ego. The content is interchangeable. As long as you don't recognize those thoughts of forms within yourself, as long as they remain unconscious, you will believe in what they say. You will be condemned to acting out those unconscious thoughts, condemned to seeking and not finding, because when those thoughts forms, when those thought forms operate, no possession, place, person, or condition will ever satisfy you. No content will satisfy you as long as the egoic structure remains in place. No matter what you have or get, you won't be happy. You will always be looking for something else that promises greater fulfillment that promises to make your incomplete self, sense of self complete and fill that sense of lack you feel within. Identification with the body. Apart from objects, another basic form of identification is with my body. Firstly, the body is male or female. And so the sense of being a man or a woman takes up a significant part of most people's sense of self. Gender becomes identity. Identification with gender is encouraged at an early age, and it forces you into a role, into a conditioned patterns of behavior that affect all aspects of your life, not just sexuality. It is a role many people become completely trapped in, even more so in some of the traditional societies that in Western culture, where identification with gender is be beginning to lessen somewhat. In some traditional cultures, the worst fate a woman can have is to be unwed or barren, and for a man to lack sexual potency, and not to be able to produce children. 
Life's fulfillment is perceived, perceived to be fulfillment of one's gender identity. In the West, it is the physical appearance of the body that contributes greatly to the sense of who you think you are. It strengthens or it strengths its strengths or weakness, its perceived beauty or ugliness rel relative to others. For many people, their sense of self-worth is intimately bound up with their physical strength, good looks, fitness, and external appearance. Many feel a diminished sense of self-worth because they perceive their body as ugly or imperfect. Hey, I will just admit right now, I got a boob job, all right? I got a boob job, I've been there, that's it. That was an experience. And I love them and I don't wanna get rid of them, but the time will come. In some cases, the mental image of concept of my body is a complete distortion of reality. A young woman may think herself of herself as overweight and therefore starve herself when in fact she is quite thin. She cannot see her body anymore. All she sees is the mental concept of her body which says, I am fat or I will become fat. At the root of this condition lies identification with the mind. As people have become more and more mind identified, which is the intensification of egoic dysfunction, there has also been a dramatic increase in the incidence of anorexia in the recent decades. In the sufferer could look at her body without the interfering judgments of her mind or even recognize those judgments for what they are instead of believing them. Or better still, if she could feel her body from within, this would initiate her healing. Those who are identified with their good looks, physical strength, or abilities experience suffering when those attributes begin to fade and disappear, as of course they will. Their very identity that was based on them is then threatened with collapse. In their case, ugly or beautiful, people derive a, a significant part of their identity, be it a negative or positive, from their body. To be more precise, they, they derive their identity from the I thought that they erroneously attach to the mental image or concept of their body, which after all is no more than a physical form that shares their destiny of all forms, impermanence and ultimately decay. We all die, right? No. <laughs> Equating the physical sense perceived body that is destined to grow old wither and die with I always leads to suffering sooner or later. To refrain from identifying with the body doesn't mean that you neglect, despise, or no longer care for it. If it is strong, beautiful, or vigorous, you can enjoy and appreciate those attributes while they last. You can also improve the body's condition through right nutrition and exercise. If you don't equate the body, equate the body with who you are when beauty fades, vigor diminishes, or the body becomes incapacitated, this will not affect your sense of worth or identify or identity in any way. In fact, as the body begins to weaken the formless dimension, the light of consciousness can shine more easily through the fading form. It is not just people with the good or near perfect bodies who are likely to equate it with who they are you can just as easily identify with the problematic body and make the body's imperfection, illness, or disability into your identity. You may then think or speak of yourself as a sufferer or as this or as that, chronic or disability. Autistic, Asperger's, uh, whatever. You receive a ADHD, all that. You receive a great deal of attention from doctors and others who constantly confirm to you your conceptual identity as a sufferer or a patient. You then unconsciously cling to the illness, COVID-19, because it has become the most important part of who you are you perceive yourself to be, of who you perceive yourself to be. It has become another thought form with which the ego can identify. 
Once the ego has found its an identity, it does not want to let go. Amazingly, but not infrequently, the ego in search of a stronger identity can and does create illnesses in order to strengthen itself through them. Feeling the inner body. Although body identification is one of the most basic form of ego, the good news is that it is also the one that you can most easily go beyond. This is done not by trying to convince yourself that you are not your body, but by shifting your attention from the external form of your body and from thoughts about your body, beautiful, ugly, strong, weak, too fat, too thin, to the feeling of aliveness inside it, like with the breathing exercises, Wim Hof. No matter what your body's appearance is on the outer level, beyond the outer form, it is an intensely alive energy field. If you are not familiar with the inner body awareness, close your eyes for a moment and find out if there is life inside your hands. Don't ask your mind. It will say, I can't feel anything. Probably it will say, give me something more interesting to think about. So instead of asking your mind, go to the hands directly. By this, I mean become aware of the subtle feeling of aliveness inside them. It is there. You must go there with your attention to notice it. You may get a slight tingling sensation at first, then a feeling of energy or liveness. If you are hold your attention to your hands for a while, the sense of aliveness will intensify. Some people won't even have to close their eyes. They will be able to feel their inner hands at the same time as they read this. Then go to your feet. Keep your attention there for a minute or so and begin to feel your hands and feet at the same time. Then incorporate other parts of the body, legs, arms, abdomen, chest, and so on, into that feeling until you're aware of the inner body as a global sense of aliveness. What I call the inner body isn't really the body anymore, but life energy, the bridge between form and formlessness matter vibrations. Make it a habit to feel the inner body as often as you can. After a while, you won't need to close your eyes anymore to feel it. For example, see if you can feel the inner body whenever you listen to someone. It almost seems like a paradox. When you are in touch with the inner body, you are not identified with your body anymore, nor are you identified with your mind. This is to say you are no longer identified with form, but moving away from the form identification towards formlessness, which we may also call being, life. It is your essence identity. Body awareness not only anchors you in the present moment, it is the doorway out of the prison that is. The ego. It also strengthens the immune system and the body's ability to heal itself. Amen. Forgetfulness of being. Ego always identifies with form, seeking yourself and thereby losing yourself in some form. Forms are not just material objects and physical bodies. More fundamental than the external forms, things, and bodies are the thought forms that consciously, that continuously arise in the field of consciousness. They are energy formations, finer and less dense than physical matter, but they are forms nonetheless. What you may be aware of as a voice in, in your head that never stops speaking, or demons, it is the stream of incessant and compulsive thinking. When every thought absorbs your attention completely, when you are so identified with the voice in your head and the emotions that accompany it, that you lose yourself in every thought and every motion, 
then you are totally identified with form and therefore in the grip of ego. Ego is a conglomeration of recurring thought forms and conditioned mental emotional patterns that are invested with the sense of I, a sense of self. Ego arises when your sense of beingness of I am, which is formless consciousness, get mixed up with form. This is the meaning of identification. This is forgetfulness of being, the primary error, the illusion of absolute separateness that turns reality into a nightmare. From Descartes' error to Sartre's, Sartre's insight, or Sartre's insight. The 17th century philosopher, Descartes, regarded as the founder of modern philosophy, gave expression to this primary error with his famous dictum, which he saw as primary truth. I think, therefore I am. This was the answer he found to the question, is there anything I can know with absolute certainty? He realized that the fact that he was always thinking was beyond doubt. And so he equated thinking with being. That is to say, identify I am with thinking. Instead of the ultimate truth, he had found the root of ego, but he didn't know that. It took almost 300 years before another famous philosopher saw something in that statement that Descartes, as well as everybody else, had overlooked. His name was Jean-Paul Sartre. I don't know, satire, Sartre. He looked at Descartes' statement, I think, therefore I am, very deeply and suddenly realized in his own words, the consciousness that says I am is not the consciousness that thinks. What did he mean by that? When you are aware that you are thinking, that awareness is not part of thinking. When you are aware that you are thinking, that awareness is not part of thinking. It is a different dimension of consciousness, the other mind. And that is the awareness that says, I am. If there were nothing but thought in you, you wouldn't even know you are thinking. You would be like a dreamer who doesn't know he is dreaming. You would, be as, you would be as identified with every thought as the dreamer is with every image in the dream. Many people still live like that, like sleepwalkers, trapped in old dysfunctional mindsets that continuously recreate the, si the same nightmarish reality. When you know you are dreaming, you are awake within the dream. Another dimension of consciousness has come in. The implication of Sartre's insight is profound, but he himself was still too identified with thinking to realize the full significance of what he has discovered, had discovered, an emerging new dimension of consciousness. The peace that passes all understanding. There are many accounts of people who experienced that emerging new dimension of consciousness as a result of tragic loss at some point in their lives. Some lost all their possessions, others their children or spouse, their social position, reputation, or physical abilities. In some cases, through disaster or war, they lost all of these things simultaneously and found themselves with nothing. We may, think, we may call this a limit situation. Whatever, we may call this a limit situation. Whatever they had identified with, whatever they gave them their sense of self had been taken away. Then suddenly, inexplicably, the anguish or intense fear they initially felt gave way to a sacred sense of presence. 
a deep peace and serenity, and complete freedom from fear. This phenomenon must have been familiar to St. Paul, who used the expression, the peace of God, which passes with passive all understanding. It is indeed a peace that doesn't seem to make sense. And the people who experienced it asked themselves, in the face of this, how can it be that I feel such peace? The answer is simple. Once you realize that the ego is and how it works, when forms that you had identified with that gave you your sense of self collapse or are taken away, it can lead to a, a collapse of the ego since ego is identification with form. When there is nothing to identify with anyone, with, with, when there is nothing to identify with anymore, who are you? When forms around you die or death approaches, your sense of beingness of I am is freed from its entanglement with form. Spirit is released from its imprisonment in matter. You realize your essential identity as formless, as an all-pervasive presence of being prior to all forms, all identifications. You realize your true identi identity as consciousness itself, rather than what consciousness had identified with. That's the peace of God. The ultimate truth of who you are is not I am this or I am that, but I am. Not everybody who experiences great losses also experiences this awakening. Thus, this identification from form. Some, in, some immediately create a strong mental image of thought form which they see themselves as a victim, whether it be circumstances, other people, an unjust fate, or God. This thought form, the emotions that it creates, such as anger, resentment, self-pity, and so on, they strongly identify with, and it immediately takes the place of all the other identifications that have collapsed through the loss. In other words, the ego quickly finds a new form. The fact that this new form is deeply unhappy, one doesn't concern the ego too much, as long as it has identity, good or bad. The fact that this new ego will be more contracted, more rigid, and more impenetrable than the old one. Whenever tra tragic loss occurs, you either resist or you yield. Some people become bitter and deeply resentful. Others become compassionate, wise, and loving. Yielding means inner acceptance of what is. You are open to life. Resistance is an inner contraction, a hardening of the shell of the ego. You are closed. Whatever action you take in a state of inner resistance, which we could also call negativity, will create more outer resistance and the universe will not be on your side. Life will not be helpful. If the shutters are closed, the sunlight cannot come in. When you yield internally, when you surrender, a new dimension of consciousness opens up. If action is impossible or necessary, your action will be in alignment with the whole and supported creative intelligence. The unconditioned consciousness, which in a state of the inner openness you become one with. Circumstances and people then become help, helpful, cooperative. Coincidence happens. Coincidence is happen. If no action is possible, you rest in the peace of inner stillness that come with surrender. You rest in God. Circumstances and people then become helpful, cooperative. Coincidences happen. If no action is possible, 
You rest in the peace and inner stillness that come with surrender. You rest in God. Meditation. Being still. Cool. A new earth. Awakening to your life's purpose. That was chapter.